So, Pencil, you dare claim that I have a problem with my narrative, do you? Because of Lancelot? Well, let me tell you something, Pencil. There can't be a Lance problem if there isn't Lance in the narrative! Thank you to our final patrons, Strawbones, Red Wolf 65, and a Midnight Gem Lord. Now, before I move this breakdown slash review of chapter 89 of Four Nights of the Apocalypse, please remember to leave your own for the chapter in the comments section down below. Leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, when you hit that little notification bell, you miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Also, also, I do a Patreon down below. You support for as low as one, cut them one, dollar month, because exclusive videos, early content, and more. Some of that exclusive content being the live reaction to this very chapter. Now, you can also become a member of the channel for as low as $3 a month to get the same perks and more. Now, let's hop into a few weeks ago's poll. So, after chapter 88, y'all know I had to ask y'all, because we've been waiting so long for them, what y'all feel about the fits? In my, in my review, I gave y'all a whole extensive stat-padded breakdown on how I felt about the, uh, the four fits of the apocalypse and my own very mixed feelings and i i'm a little bit a little bit bamboozled i i like i get it we had some fire in there like i said i think the whole tristan platoon except for i sold and partially tristan himself was looking kind of drippy donnie he was also pretty drippy i won't lie to you but you know there were some problems in there there was your glades, your hands, your eyes sold, sweet mother mercy, what they do to my boy Nazians. Like, we, we, we had some problems. But to my shock, horror. 60% <laughs> of y'all said, yes, the fits were fire. I can't wait for them in the new fights. And, you know, I respect your opinion. I do. I 100% do. And who knows? Maybe you were just like, you know, the good outweighs the bad here. Jade, a non-character, was looking so saucy. I just had to ignore the bad parts. And I get that, I get that. But at least I'm happy 40% of y'all were like, no, the fits were pure trash. Can't wait for the next designs. <laughs> and that's mainly where I am, right? Because, like, honestly, like I said, the Tristan platoon, for the most part, can keep it. Just give give Tristan, like, another fit. <laughs> or, like, another um leg guard, and then I think we'd be good on his front. But... I don't know, dog. Like some of these, some of these just weren't right. <laughs> some of these were just were not right. But hey, forty percent to sixty percent, I can't knock y'all hustle. It'd be like that when it'd be like that sometimes. Thank you so much for participating in that poll. Make sure you get your input in on tomorrow's poll dropping at twelve p.m. Make sure your input is included on next week's review. Now let's hop into chapter eighty-nine. What's up, guys? I'm the pencil here. Here we are to review chapter eighty-nine of Four Nights of the Up 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 Up, 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 up which is known as. Eh, 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 eh. Please clear my thought on the two time for that. <laughs> the four knights set out. And I won't lie to you. Like, no, no Kizzy, no Capperton. Like, this chapter has a lot. But at the same time, all that chapter has falls so, so short and so irrelevant. Because we got Sylvan back. Sylvan's still in the narrative. We saw him right at the end of the chapter. That's the only thing that matters. Review over. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys have wonderful. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's let's hop into the chapter itself. So open up, we do get to see that Meliodas lies to their faces. Like straight up. Cold heart like let's see. One, two. Ah you know what? I'll actually give it that. More of them look good than they do bad. Because Lancelot's fit didn't change. Tristan, as long as they don't see the leg guard, I don't care. I think he looks pretty drippy without it. Kion, he looks good. Jade, he looks good. So that's four. Percival, like I said in the last review, with the whole cape and helmet, the fit looks way better. I think the fit on its own was a little bit rocky, but Percival now looks fine with the helmet and the cape, mainly because it covers most of it and it keeps more of his original design. Donnie looks fine. So you know what? Yeah, it's mainly just like four real bad ones that like soured my taste. So I can I can go with that. I can go with that. It literally is 60-40. So I can I can rock with that. I can rock with that. However, enough of Meliodas' lies in the seat. We see that it's time to go. And Meliodas is quite truthful when he says, okay, being real with y'all. It's probably only going to get worse from here on out. Like, there's definitely no guarantee that things are going to get easier, but you're going to have to find a way to camel out one way or another because I can't go there. So all you human people, go do your human things. And we see 
that while half the crew is set up pretty seriously, like Lance posted up hand in pocket, Tristan hands on the side, posted up ready to rock, Jade ugly as all. Well, see, I can't. That's the thing. I can't call Jade ugly when I think he's the drippiest. But Jade serious, Kion annoyed, but you know that's like Kion's personality in itself. I sold. You know, she got her eyes on the prize. She looking at that royal. Let me not say that. Let me not say that. Let me not. You know what I was going to say, if you know what I was going to say. And if you didn't, good. Stay pure. But regardless, <laughs> I like how we're still addressing the travesty that was the end of last chapter. Like, Percival is asking Gawain, hey, are you okay? Don't worry. I suffer through that torment, too. I'm also thinking of committing treason just because of that. <laughs> like, the fact that Gawain is still struggling from the after effects of those, what she calls repulsive leftovers, is absolutely hilarious. Though... Is this like a a digestive feat? Like, or does this get chalked up to Percy's healing? Because she got disabled for a whole day. But Percy ate pretty much the same thing. And then, like, he got up relatively quickly. Because he got up the same day he got to Leonis. So, like, Percy's digestive system plus healing is better than Gawain's. So, Percy can resist poisons while Gawain can't. You gotta get them... You gotta, gotta stay on the scaling brain. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> but speaking of, we do get to see that... Nagaba heard me. Nagaba heard me. He must be subscribed to the channel. He he must be in the walls. Gosh darn it, he's in the walls. Because, you know, I was seriously wondering, just just how are you planning to? Just what way in this good green galaxy are you going to write the plot now that the four knights have gathered and Lance is as strong as he is? And Nagaba, hearing me and understanding my critique, said, you know what? Fine, you don't like the four knights being together because you don't have a tension-filled plot. We're separating them. Lance leaves and like I, I mean like what <laughs> I, I I mean it, it works it works because the thing is Lance won't be there right and the way that Melius offers to get them back together can be easily like stolen like if someone blitzes who's ever holding the orbs there's no way they're gonna be able to contact Lance a lot unless Percy magically develops the power of like teleportation I don't think Gawain would even be able to like teleport Lance from wherever he is to where they are to help or something like that. Like, legitimately, you got me there, Nagaba. Mainly because, right, the whole story up to this point has been building up to these four connecting, right? The whole story has been, we're gathering the four knights. So when I thought we got all of them, my brain was just so, like, lasered in on the fact all four knights are here. They're not going to separate anytime soon. And Nakaba doesn't even let the arc start before they separate. So, hey, whatever. Got to balance the narrative in one way or another. And we see as Percy's like, hold on a second. Yo, level me real quick, Mel. Then Kion being Kion needs to get smacked. And we see that Percival asked the same question that I immediately thought when I first read this. It was like, hey, um, even though the Four Knights of Prophecy just got together, we're getting split up again? And Melly just goes on to explain, well, reasonably, it's just temporary. We don't know where or how to get into Camelot, so we have no choice but to feel it out. It's much more efficient to spread out our search, even if just a little bit. Anything will do. If you find any clues, use these to let us know. The information, if it's solid, will bring all of you back together. We shall use Thetis and her abilities to do just that. And, like, I do get it, but, like, what if this portal to Camelot that opens is, like, very limited window? Like, a slight, like, it can just barely happen in time. Like, a knight knows what they plan to do, knows that they're going to be used to get into Camelot, and they immediately go to, like, get themselves up out of here. Like, I'm not sure how quick Thetis' magic is, but I don't know. It seems like kind of a risk. At least, at least to me, right? I feel like it would be better. It's going to be slower, but if anything, splitting up here doesn't necessarily provide any extra utility at least not in my mind right sure you get to cover more area but i think the insecurity of having people split up is it's not good it's like the horror movie trope all over again except like a lot less horror unless we run into like ordo again and he's an ugly beast but with that being the case i don't know i don't know i see why knockup is doing it obviously once again i i always say this about authors they don't always power scale but when they do, it's usually they need... <laughs> this is weird. How do I put it? They don't always power scale, but when they do, it's to make sure the plot doesn't break. So this is literally just an anti-plot breaking thing, even if 
I don't think it makes the most sense logically because of like narrow windows and stuff like that. And the fact that we'll get into it in a little bit once we get onto the next page. But hey, you know, it's a little, it's a little shady, but you know, I see why Naka was doing it, right? Like once again, you just can't, you can't have a plot with Lancelot around. And even if this is like preserving the plot, it's Naka but directly admitting, oh yeah, uh, I may have made him too strong. Can't write a plot with him right now. So I'll take my dub. I will take my dub. But the thing is, right? These teams seem very poorly optimized for running into threats, right? Because we have Team Percival and Gawain, who are going to search up in the Fairy King's Forest in Northern Britannia. So they're probably going to meet King and kids, which will be nice. I'm I'm waiting to meet their twins. It's, it's been so long. So that's obviously where they're going to go. We have Team Tristan going to go search Old Camelot. You know, the, the old hangout of the villain squad in Southern Britannia. And then Lancelot is going to search, search? <laughs> Lancelot is going to search Eastern Britannia. Is, is there a little bit of a imbalance, right? Because here's the thing. Percival and Gawain, real strong people. Percival can get amped. Just, just hit him hard enough, but don't like hit him too hard. But as long as his friends are fine, like hit him really, really hard, like hard enough to take him out because he'll just get back up again. So maybe I can slightly understand that. But even still, like, any person who knows that about Percy, and it should be common knowledge, at least at this point, they're not gonna, they're gonna, like, instantly execute Bro Bro and his friends. He's not that strong. Same with Gawain. Gawain is pretty powerful, but, like, I'd say Percy's pretty relative to her. And overall, like, if they run into anybody who's Melagallant here, they lost. The whole crew. Done. I don't know, unless Nasians really comes in with those buffs and debuffs, I don't see how they're beating anyone who's Melagallant here. I just don't. I just don't think they can. For Team Tristan, they are above Melagallant here. But, the thing is, they are only above Melagallant here if Tristan goes demon mode. And we know, when Tristan goes demon mode, he doesn't really have much control over himself. And you know what you need? You need someone there to stop him. And you know where they're going? To the one place where I don't think anyone exists that could stop him. Like, at least if they were going to where Team Percival and Team Gawain is going, then I could make give an excuse, right? Because King should be more than powerful enough to one-shot Tristan. Like, even Demon Tristan being above high commandment level, or being above Fuse mid-commandment tier, yeah, it's impressive, but it's not like end of series sins impressive it's just not king should one shot him or heck arguably diane should one shot him if she dances up a little bit and that's and that's if we go with the fact that they have no amps from the previous series well as we've seen meliodas has gotten way stronger from the previous series so it's likely that king and diane also got some universal amps so i could see it if tristan was going there but he's heading to old camelot who's in old camelot that could stop a demon tristan if they run into somebody i don't know his team isn't doing it they can they can barely defend themselves not to talk of defend themselves from a demon tristan i'm not sure about that move lance is fine like lance could literally go anywhere lance could walk the earth alone and be just fine so i'm not i'm not shocked and also tristan could go to his group too like legitimately he could go to benwick as well because bond should also be able to one-shot demon tristan it's weird like the only person who has an impressive power up that is hard to control is going to the one spot where I don't think we have anyone to actively control them. Like Lance is not going to be there to one shot Demon Tristan when Demon Tristan goes crazy. He's just not going to be there. Percival and Gawain, even if they were there, they wouldn't be able to one shot him quickly enough because he used to be too powerful. So I don't know why Meliodas is sending him to old Camelot. Like I get why he's sending Lance to Benwick. Obviously Bond is his best friend that still alive and he obviously wants bond to see his son again nice makes sense same thing for elaine and i don't like outside of our main character meeting king and diane i don't see why you wouldn't at least at least swap team percival and gawain with team tristan because you kill two birds with one stone there old camelot i'm not exactly sure where gawain is from but i'm assuming she's from nearby if her father is arthur's brother so like reasonably them going there would probably be better because she'll be familiar with the area most likely and once again these teams don't necessarily i mean despair percy can be stopped by his homies so like there's there's no worry about that and then if you were to send team tristan up to the fairy king's forest once again they'd be fine but 
yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure about these picks. I'm not sure about these picks. I'd literally just say t- swap Tristan's team with Percival's team in terms of where they're going, and they'd be fine. But this current setup, I feel like it's a leading to disaster. The other thing that's weird is that we're splitting up. Like, how are we going to write this story now? And not in the, like, oh, no, there's not going to be tension in the narrative because Lance is here. But, like, we have four main characters who are split up into three groups. Are we going to have, like, individual arcs locked on to all these characters or each individual group? Are we going to have, like, chapter switch-ups where we follow one group, then we leave to another group, then we leave to another group? I don't know. I think the cleanest and safest version of that story would be the we set aside an arc for each one. Because, like, I can already imagine for Lance and Percival alone, like, not even talk of Tristan's group, you're going to want to have whole arcs set around that. Because you're going to be reintroducing characters for the first time. Like, we have not seen Bon, King, or Diane, except for that one panel of them each in Arthur's fight a couple pages back. A couple pages, a couple chapters back. That's it. That's all we've seen of them. So, obviously, we're going to get, like, whole introductions and stuff to them. So, I doubt Nock was going to want to be cutting away. I don't know. It's an interesting thing, an interesting way to tell the story. Not what I was expecting. I'll be completely real, especially after we just gathered them. But it appears I'm not the only issue with how they've been <laughs> assigned and segregated because a man puts his hand up and it says, hey, yo, your majesty, could you uh, send someone else there instead? And we see Tristan and Kion notice this. And Kion, Kion's a demon, bro. Kion is different, dog. Like, how... Once again, once again, I know I keep saying it, but, like, this level of hating can't be healthy, bro. Kyle's gonna live till 30. In a verse where, shockingly enough, age expectancy is pretty high for humans. Like, bro, you gotta, you gotta relax. You gotta calm down. It is not that deep. It is never that deep, bro. Bro went from, oh, wow, he said something to, too bad, his majesty's orders are absolute. Like, bro, bro. <laughs> really? <laughs> It got better. I just looked at it again, and Jay Lou is <laughs> tackling him back. Because God is that much on demon side. Like, God, you were there, bruh. Like, I get... This is going to sound bad. I still 100% get disrespecting Percy and Gawain. Especially Gawain now. Gawain is like two feet tall. Sure, she burned the back of your head off. But still, you know, talk that talk. I bet if you were to hit Gawain with some sills, bada bing, bada boom, she'd be down for the count. But, but Lance... Like, you saw Lance. Like, that's that's something that you saw in front of you. You know he's strong. Like, you were there. Well, maybe he wasn't there. But you should have sensed your your lord, your cousin, Tristan, get absolutely one-shot by Lance. So I, I don't get why I don't get why you got the confidence, the gall, the nerve. Like, this is like me after seeing one of my homies, like, pull out the most ultimate clutch fight when he got jumped 3v1. And then suddenly thinking, I can fight him. Like, no, I can't, obviously. But Kaya, Kaya's got that dog in him. <laughs> it may be a little bit of a <laughs> a risky dog, but he got that dog in him. And we see that completely ignoring his... It's so weird to think that. By all technicalities, Kaya is more Meliodas' nephew than Lance will ever be. But regardless, we see that Meliodas is like, Hey, what's wrong, kid? You don't want to go? And we see that Lance, one of... Once again, I'm liking that we're getting more sides of his humanity outside of, like, the character that I don't like. Lance, he gets a little flustered, and he's like, hey, Unc, let me be real with you. I, I, just, I just can't go back home yet. It's just not not that time. And we see that Meliodas instantly understands. He's like, oh, you promised to find Jericho and bring her back, right? Well, you found her, so you already fulfilled half your promise, haven't you? And Lance, of course, is like, half? Really, Unc? And I, I do kind of get it. But, like, Lance, your parents, even though they should probably be able to send... That's a, that's such a weird thing, though. Like, sensory abilities in Seven Lee Sins are so oddly inconsistent that reasonably, even while suppressed with how powerful suppressed Lance is, his parents should know he's fine. Like, they should just be able to feel his presence. Be like, oh, okay, my kid's still alive. Like, I get it if maybe he was, like, Percy level or Gawain level, then maybe you wouldn't be able to sense him. But, like, bare minimum bare minimum doing this as low ball as possible lancelot is high commandment level if i'm low balling him to the ultimate degree lancelot's high commandment level and we know that the commandments can be sensed across the entire continent like reasonably lance and his family is like constantly connected just because of how powerful they are but i can definitely understand why he should go back and see them right because like 
like it's it's the same as like calling someone on the phone and actually seeing them in real life. Like I can call my long distance family on the phone, but it just doesn't hit as different as actually going to see them. So I can definitely see why Meliodas is so encouraging Lance to go back because you know that's his best friend's son, and he knows how passionate Bond was and how happy Bond was to have a kid. So obviously this kid, for one reason or another, not wanting to go back, even if it's for a good reason. Mel's going to want to send his nephew back. And I think that's nice. You know, these are two characters that really have, it's a deep tie that's been set up mostly off screen, but the ramifications of it and the understanding of each other that it comes from it. I love it. I love it. And we see that Meliodas says, Hey, I know I get it, bro. The glass got to be half full though. Just head home and let me know about it. You have let you have got to let your mom and dad know you're doing okay every now and then. Which makes me believe that Lance really has not gone back. Like, straight up, I, what, he's 16 now? He was 14 in Grudge of Edinburgh, so he may have not been back in like three or four years. Depending on whether or not you, like, let's see, 12? Because he, he spent three years when he was 10. So let's assume he came out 13. At least three years without seeing your parents. Yeah, after you disappeared for another three years, yeah, yeah, I don't blame Mel. I bet Mel would be stressed. I'd be stressed. Like, if my kid just randomly disappeared for three years and said, I right, mom, dad, I'm out, and then hasn't come back in three years, yeah, I would I would be worried, too. I'd probably, like, I'd probably tell Lay, like, hey, hold down the fort. I'm going to go find our boy. <laughs> Drag him back here so we can eat dinner with us at least once. Like, geez, come on now. Then again, who knows? Once again, I don't have kids yet, so maybe that, maybe that feeling will change. I don't know. Lance seems like a cool kid. And we see that Lance was like, man, whatever. And once again, like, everyone else is looking at him with concern, but Kyan is looking at him with such glee, like, seeing that he has to suffer by seeing his parents, and Kyan is just like, hey, 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 hey. Once again, it's crazy to think that the Four Knights' top op is one of their main allies. Like, legitimately, wholeheartedly, outside of Ironside himself, Kyan has been more of an op to the Four Knights than Arthur. Like, Kion actively tried to get rid of... Kion tried to do... And nearly succeed... Well, not nearly succeed. No, he actually kind of did nearly succeed in getting rid of the four knights more than Pelgar did. More than <laughs> Ironside did. More than Ardbeg did. More than anyone did. Like, he, he's been out there. He's been... He's been he nearly stab it. I'm not going to lie to you. So, it's kind of crazy. And we see that... Lance kind of just accepts his fate. He's like, ugh, seriously? But Melios continues and said, that being said, leave the search to dubs for me. And once again, I get it. I just don't... I, like, of all the... Like, do any... Are all, any other names treated differently from the Japanese to the English? Like, is Meliodas something else in Japanese? And I'm just used to it being Meliodas. Like, why can we not say Nabuzu? Like, does Nabuzu have some sort of meaning that I just don't know? Because I don't know why, it's, Dubs is such a specifically, it's like the only letter they share is the D and the U. Like, every other letter is different. I don't know why Dubs is the Buzu's translated name. Like, Dahlia doesn't change, but Dahlia's a flower. I'm not sure if Dubs, Dubs means something that the Buzu means in English, and that it's like a reference to something. When I hear Dubs, I think of like English or Japanese Dubs, but hey. I'm a filthy anime fan. So, and I, of course, that's what comes to my mind. And we see that Lance is shocked. Tristan is neutral. And both Gawain and Percy. Once again, it's so hilarious that they're the same size, though. Though it's interesting. Gawain should be smaller than Percy. But and they're actually going to be portrayed in the same size a lot more now. I love how they both say, Tubbs? Tubbs? What? Tubbs? And I wonder how that works. Well, Tabuzu. Okay, that's what, in the original, it's Tabuzu. And then Gawain goes on to mistake Meliodas, or the person that Meliodas is talking about, as the Great Took Taboo. And once again, I feel like that's a reference to something that I should get, but the only Taboo I can think of is the one from Super Smash Bros. Brawl. I, so, so it's weird how many name association things I have that just don't correlate to anything that I think they should correlate to. And we see that Percy actually remembers hearing about Tabuzu. And we see... That Percy's like, wait a minute, hold on. Dubs, 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 dubs. He gets dubs because he makes weapons for the people who gets the. Hey, hey, he was a he was a craftsman, right? And we see that Tristan's like, oh wow, you're actually intelligent. You heard right. The giant craftsman dubs. He cre 
dubs. I, I'm sorry. I, I'll get used to it. Because I'm assuming we're going to have a little mini dubs arc. So I'm going to have to get used to saying it. Because I don't think I should call him Dabuzu if his name is officially dubs in the English dub. So, Dubs, the Giant's Craftsman, he created many tools such as the Coffin of Eternal Darkness and the Seven Deadly Sins Sacred Treasures, making him the greatest artisan in the history of Britannia. A couple things. One. Like, like, what? What? Like, who commissioned him to make the Seven Deadly Sins Sacred Treasures? Was it Bell? And, like, were, how recently were they made? Because for some reason, in my heart of hearts, I always thought they were, like, ancient old weapons but if he just made them in the seven deadly sins era that's kind of crazy two where did bro go like for the longest time i thought he was captured and like making weapons for arthur but and maybe that is the case who knows maybe that sword that arthur has carwin on was made by dubs but i i don't know <laughs> apparently they've been hunting for him and i'll admit he does look way cooler in the manga like compared to his anime counterpart he looks way cool i love the I love the way he's, like, crafting the shield with the floating hammer, and he has, like, the gauntlet claw hand and the hammer behind It's, like, a really, really cool... He looks a really cool guy compared to what he did in Curse by Light. But even with this being the case, we see that he apparently has just been missing for a while. Lancelot has been looking for dubs for ages, mainly because Lance needs a weapon that suits him, and he could get a spirit spear. But I, I wonder, right? Is Gloxidia's Spirit Spear a sacred treasure? Like, does it count? It should be. It doesn't have as many forms as Chassis Full. That's just, it's just unexplored. But I wonder, like, do all the Spirit Spears count as sacred treasures? Or at least sacred treasure level weapons? Did King really only get that when he became a Sin? Did he never have it before? I don't remember him having it in the flashbacks. So I'm not sure. It's just interesting. Though we do get to see that, obviously, Percival's wondering, like, wait a second. I mean, like, I get he breaks him, but, like, he can just buy a weapon, can he? And we see the Melodus is like, ah, you know, if it were that easy, I wouldn't have to go hunt him down myself. And we see that Melodus decides to drop a bomb. Allow me to demonstrate. <clears throat> there isn't any weapon that can withstand the strength of Lancelot's magic power. And, um, obviously, this isn't, like, this is strangely crazy, but not too crazy, right? Because this isn't the first time we've met characters who simply cannot use lesser weapons or else they will break. Meliodas was the last character who I distinctly remember doing that. Like, remember, Liz's gift sword broke when he tried to use it on the Albion because it literally just couldn't handle his gir- His le- his mighty me- he, It just couldn't handle his raw power. And thusly, that's when Merlin had to pull out Lost Vein for him. Because Lost Vein was strong enough to withstand it. So, reasonably, it's not too crazy that Lancelot is, like, overflowing with magic strength. I guess, like, the insanity of the statement, it says that any weapon. Which implies that any existing weapon can't do it. But I think that's also kind of a lie. Like, I don't see Lancelot shattering Lost Vein if he were to pick it up right like if you were to use shining road through lost vein i think lost vein would be just fine maybe rita because it's broken now like maybe i could see that and rita shattered pretty easily it was shockingly brittle but like gideon the spirit spears heck even alden like i don't know some of those weapons even current shoes i don't think they're breaking under lance's magical power so i think like the the wank of the statement is saying that like <laughs> The best way you can use this to wink Lancelot to like top one of the verse is being like no weapon in existence can handle it. And then you go to the straight to like Excalibur, which is a weapon in the verse. It does exist and it can handle chaos magic. And then you say Lance would destroy that weapon too. And then bada bing bada boom. He's strong from the verse. That's the most wank you can use for this statement. But even then like me Lance stand number 415. I wouldn't use that just because it's like if he's going to get a sacred treasure made. I obviously think it's just you need a sacred treasure to your weapon and none of the sins are willing to give theirs up for good reason too. like Meliodas likely needs Lost Fane. We saw what happened when he didn't have Lost Fane. We know that Merlin's not on our side. Rita is broken. Shoot. Gideon may not be in use as often, but Diane still has it. She was still wielding it pretty recently. 
We saw a king. Obviously, King's not going to be able to give up his spirit spirit, even if he wants to, to his nephew. The only thing I can hypothetically see Lance getting as a substitute for now until he gets his own specific spirit spear is if he finds Gloxinia. Or, like, Gloxinia's old... Like, if he finds Basquias, then we're going crazy. Because reasonably, unless the Sacred Tree took it back, it should still exist, right? Like, it still should be out there. That is a sacred treasure level weapon. So, for all intents and purposes, all Lance has to do is get do a little grave robbing. And then, bada bing, bada boom, you get one of the best spirit spears in the room. Like, top two. Like, I think Lance could go crazy with that. But, obviously, I don't... Like, part of me wants to think that Nakamura would send Lance grave robbing, especially if he's heading around Benwick. But then again, that's not the original fair game. Where did Gloxinia die? Where are their bodies? Did they ever go back and get those? I genuinely don't know. I'm assuming they did. I doubt they just left them there. Mel probably went and gave them proper burials and stuff like that. But, like... Mel, did you find their spear? <laughs> like, did you find Gloxinia's spear? Because if so... Bringing Boskias back would have me foaming at the mouth. Like, 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 no lie, no lie. Mad foam, mad foam, Fo froth everywhere. I, I, I may start crying. Tears of joy. Like that, the reunion with Boskias would bring legitimate, unbridled tears to my eyes. However, <laughs> enough theorizing about the sacred treasure that Lance is likely not going to get in terms of the spirit spirit Boskias. We do get to see that everyone there, except for like Tristan is blown away. Percy's sweating. Gawain is in shock. <laughs> Anne is losing it. Nasians is sweating. And Donnie's like, oh, that's why he said he would pay me back for my dagger. Speaking of which, where is your dagger? <laughs> Donnie, don't you need that, my boy? But regardless, we see that Donnie is the one to notice. He's like, oh, wait a second. Yeah, every single time Lance uses magic, his weapon shatters the pieces. Even like Carwinon, a weapon that literally recovers every time it's used why and we see that nasians before lance can even answer he's like oh that makes sense that's why he uses a bow and arrow and percy's like uh what and we see nasians explain it's inefficient to carry multiple swords and spears but arrows can be easily carried and replenished and like i'm not exactly sure how magically proficient lance is but like wouldn't teaching him a port absolutely erase this problem like, if he could just summon the weapon to himself when he needs it, I think that'd be more convenient. Like, don't, not knocking bow and arrows, but, <laughs> not knocking them. But with that being the case, I don't think he can use Shining Road with his arrows. He even says himself, well, yeah, I only know how to, well, no, I only know how much magical power to put into arrows. So I don't think he can use Shining Road. So I think him, like, rarely having access to his most powerful attack is kind of kind of a problem like i think he should have at least one either one weapon on him like a dagger it doesn't have to be too big like we saw he could use a dagger for it so either use have one dagger on him or like teach him a port go aim give him some lessons real quick and have him learn how to teleport his weapon to him because then in that case he can just have a storage room of weapons and then summon them whenever he needs them whenever he needs to hit someone with a shiny road sure they're, the whole verse kind of right now is a Shining Road victim, so I, I can see why Nakama doesn't want to give him direct access to it, but there are inverse ways around it. Like, even if a whole bunch of weapons isn't too cumbersome, like, at least a waistband of daggers isn't too much. Like, he, he, can, put, he can literally put on a belt and have two daggers dangling from the sides, and that's two Shining Roads right there. I think it's a little bit... It's a little bit too risky to not have access to your most powerful attack at all times. Like, if you can't do it from himself and he needs a conduit for it, then I think he should have it on him. Because, like, say he runs into someone like a Gallon who doesn't... Well, he could one-shot Gallon, unfortunately. <laughs> but in terms of, like, what if he runs into someone who's comparable to him, but they don't carry a weapon on him? Like, they just purely throw hands, or they are purely a magic user. What is he supposed to do then if he can't have access to Shredding Road? I don't know. That's the thing. He definitely needs... He, he should have some way around that. But once again, this is just all all of the effort of balancing, right? That's why I feel like a lot of these narrative choices are. We're removing Lance from the main group so we can have tension with the main groups. We're removing Lance's abilities or the easy access to them because if he has access to them, the plot breaks. Like, this is all... This whole chapter is kind of just not going to be like, hey, we're just going to peel the narrative back a little bit. We're going to calm it down a little bit because we cannot keep it at this pace. <laughs> because if we were to keep it at this pace we would not have a narrative 
and we see that Donnie makes a claim that I don't put much stock in. Like, I don't know why. Call, call it me being, like, suspicious. Because Donnie claims, oh, so back when you beat the talisman's boss, that was your full power? And notably, Lance neither agrees. Well, he kind of agrees indirectly. He says, I didn't have much of a choice. I've never been good with knives. But the thing is, we know definitively he was using his left hand. And he didn't have any aura. So, I highly doubt that was his full power. I don't think we've seen a full power Shining Road yet. I just don't think we have. We haven't even seen a full power Lance yet. Like, actually fight. Because the only blow he landed when he actually used some of his strength was in Arthur. That sounds so bad. But, like, legitimately, in Arthur. When he got that jab in, but Arthur managed to phase it. So... I, oh, and he knocked around some of Arthur's constructs. So I don't think that was his full power. That probably that was suppressed Lance with his non-dominant hand. Still. It's crazy to think about considering how big that Shining Road was. Remember, it absolutely... It made that gigantic multi-legged horse they were on, slept near, look minuscule in size. So a full power Shining Road probably goes crazy. And we see that both Donnie and Percival are like, Whoa, Lance, you're even more goaded than I thought. And Lance is like, I am... I will forever be the ultimate goat and you shall always respect me for it though we do get to see that Leotis is like I right, enough slopping off Lance he has enough people that want to do that already listen up there will be more enemies and troubles ahead than ever before but there will also be allies everywhere who fought in the holy war with the seven deadly sins if you're if they're in trouble lend them a hand and they'll be sure to lend a hand too though admittedly like unless these people have been training once again we have no idea how much stronger some of these characters have gotten. But, like, the people he highlights here, I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> like, how much, how useful are they going to be? Like, Matrona was weaker than, what, No Magic Gallon? Garharde? Fought her. What, she fell to some humans? 3,000 year past humans? I'm not sure how much strong... I'm not sure how strong they were, but they should have been fought her. Zaneri and... I'm doing it. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Thinking, but whatever. The scenario and Jenna. There we go. Like they weren't that powerful either. Like e like everyone should be at least maybe not. The humans on our squad may not be like your Nazians, your Anne, your Donnie, but like even Percival, the self-proclaimed weakest of the knights, by having any relativity to Melly Gallon and being able to detonate <laughs> Chaos Gallon, like. The, at least the people Mel showed here are pretty useless. I think it would have been better to show some of the sins or something like that. Like, people of actual notoriety and power before showing them. Because, like, what what are they going to do? <laughs> like, and that's bad. I know I should disrespect them like that, but I'm going to disrespect them like that. Like, what are they going to... What what are, what are they cooking? <laughs> what are they cooking over this past 16-year period? I got to know. I really got to know. And we see... That Meliodas hypes him up. He's like, you have got to see this mission through. No matter the cost. No matter how much bread you lose. You got to keep putting money in the pot. And we see that the humans of the platoons are like, right. It's Isol, Jade, Kion, Donnie, Nasians, and Anne. They're like, yeah, we'll do it. And Percy... He, he gets all he gets all gassed up. Like he he even blows steam out his nose. He's that gassed up, and he reaches back and he pulls it out he, and he smacks it on Melios's forehead and tells him to. I need to, you know. Sometimes, sometimes, like I stop, like the the amount of jokes I cut out that I I know I can't keep in would probably astound some of you. No lie. Like if I were to give some of y'all the raw files. And the uh, versus the edited files, like I can tell you, there's at least ten minutes gone of some reviews just based on bad jokes alone. But regardless, we do get to see that Percival. He's all gassed up as he says, "I'll be sure to carry out my mission in the name of the Percival Sword." And he flashes this thing that Melion should have stole a long time ago. He still has the Coffin of Eternal Darkness piece, and I'll admit. This is kind of the dumbest part of the chapter. I, I get it. I get it. A weapon is a weapon, and every knight needs a weapon. Because, you know, amps are nice. But dog. Dog. 
Meliodas looks at it, right? He looks at it dead in the face, and then he smiles. Because obviously, you know, Dragon Handle was once his burden to carry. Then it got stolen from him by the Big Brother Boom. The Demon Clan was freed. But Meliodas goes on to, well, we'll get to it. We see that Jade, Kion, and Isol just start... It's a ragging on my boy. They're like, oh, he said it so seriously. Oh, that's rich. He named his sword after himself. Kyan, where's your sword? Hmm? Where's your weapon? Huh? What what combat utility do you provide? Okay, he kind of does have insane combat utility. He needs he needs some setup, but he do kind of got it on him. I won't lie. The soaps are kind of crazy. But I said, why are you laughing? Hmm? Hmm? Who had to get saved by their not boyfriend? Wasn't Percival. <laughs> I can tell you that. It wasn't Percival. Well, Kinda was personal. Nazis, Nazis did clutch up, but still, come on now. And we do get to see that Donnie's like, well, I mean, that's like, that's like how to hide. The personal sword kind of goes crazy. But wouldn't like the sword of eternal darkness go a little bit harder? I'm not gonna lie, that do go kind of hard. Like eternal, the the blade of eternal darkness, the sword of eternal darkness, eternal darkness on its own just sounds fire as it is the coffin that's why the coffin of eternal darkness is so metal so i can't even knock donnie that is a much cooler sword name then we do get to see that nazine is the goat is like hold on a second now that you mention it that dragon handle was a piece of the coffin of eternal darkness right oh yeah that's right it's a magic tool that was used to seal away the demon clan and percy he's still holding it and wondering like hey uh guys why are you why are you looking at me like that why are you looking at my sword like that Dude, is it too small? But you guys realize it's about the it's about the motion in the ocean, right? Not the size of the ship. Come on, guys, st st you're making me feel uncomfortable. And we see that all three of the Percy platoon have a revelation at the same time. Like, hmm, hmm, hmm? ah, and the king, who's currently cheesing out the wazoo right now, is a demon. Give that handle back right now. If someone steals it, they can steal the king away, right? It's too much of a responsibility. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the best place to leave it in is its original wielder. Like give it back to Mel. At least in my mind, that's the safest thing to do. Because now that Meliodas has been confirmed, right? At least in some way, shape or form to be a viable threat. Like he is still a threat after all these years to Arthur. The last thing you want is him and Zeldris, another very likely viable threat, sealed away. It's simple as that. So any way you can reduce that risk, the better. So Percy, especially now that he's not even going to be traveling with Lance, he's going to be traveling with Gawain and his crew. Yeah, him keeping the blade is really, really risky. Like, I was even getting on Arthur, Pelgard pretty much everyone's case when they pulled up first and saw a person will have the blade and didn't take it like this is a win con right here this is <laughs> this is straight up an easy dub all you need to do is snatch it admittedly admittedly i mean the thing is like arthur you just keep it in his realm and they're stuck out of luck but if the coffin were to be resealed elizabeth is still here tristan is still tristan could likely actually just free it he could open it himself and I could definitely, I still think Melius is going to be sealed for a while, and maybe they'll release him right at the very end for the final group battle against Arthur or whatever threat there is. But still, like, raising the risk of it by having Percival carry it around, kind of stupid. I wouldn't have liked that. And I want to, like, me personally, put me in Meliodas' shoes, I'd be like, hey, sorry, kid, but I got you a different sword because that sword is uh, it's a little bit too risky for you to have when you're still fodder. <laughs> Give it to me. But we see that Meliodas is like, oh, just keep it, Percival. You were the ones who got it back, after all. I'll gladly put my fate in your hands. And uh, I wouldn't. I get it. They are the four nights of prophecy that are destined to save the kingdom. To save the world. But, um... That's a little bit too risky. Like, like say you had something that you knew could immediately wipe you off the face of the earth. And you know that at any point, it really can be stolen from you. Even if it's on you, it can be taken. But it's harder if it was on you at all times. Imagine if instead of keeping that thing that could wipe you from existence on you at all times, you give it to some random 16-year-old kid you just met. Like yesterday. And said, hey, 
you found it <laughs> lying about, you can take it. I don't know. I, I That's not a risk worth taking, especially considering they were lucky to stumble across Ironside where they did. Like, if Ironside hadn't been in that specific town, or no, if they hadn't stumbled across Ironside in Yan's town, and Ironside just charged the coffin, that's a GG. And now that they know the Knights are aware of the coffin's properties, all they need to do is grab it, teleport out back to Camelot, find a town of victims to use, go there, get the victims, charge it up, and immediately drop in on Melly. And then bada bing, bada boom. Arguably, I'd say pretty clearly, like, Bond may, I assume Bond is probably still relative, but I'd say on the lower end, King is probably still pretty strong, but lower end. Meliodas is the best piece you have in this chess game. Meliodas is the queen <laughs> right now. While the cast, like, essentially, in terms of powerhouses, you have Lance and Mel as immediate access ones that we've met so far in the narrative and have, like, a quantitative place to put next to Arthur. You lose one of them, and your combat viability goes down a lot. So, I mean, I get what Meliodas says here. This is a good way to engineer trust in them. He says, like, we put this heavy burden on you kids. Well, we should be protecting you. So taking this kind of risk is only fair. But I don't know, Mel. I think it would be better that you keep this so you can always be around to protect them. Because while they're off and about carrying this blade around, and it gets snatched, you're not going to be there to protect them the moment they get this blade from him. So, like, I get it, but it's not, it's just not worth the risk. Like, the Carfax, just not clear to me. And we see certain different reactions. First, we see the person who's going to be like, whew, wow, the king, the king really trusts us like that, like that. Like, I was playing to commit treason, like, five seconds ago, but now I trust him. And then we get to see Lance notices that Tristan has his head down. Tristan is sad. And once again, I do... Tristan, Tristan's character is one that's very interesting. Because it obviously falls into, like, an inadequacy arc. And we see that this isn't just coming from people who are stronger than him, like Lancelot. Who notices that Tristan's sad. But it's also coming from people weaker than him getting the trust of his father. So it really makes it seem like the relationship between Meliodas and Tristan... Is not as is not as happy as it seems. Probably not as happy as Meliodas wants it to be, and not as happy as Tristan wants it to be, because Tristan feels inadequate next to all these people that Meliodas is putting his faith in. And I understand that. That's got to be rough, especially for a teenager, right? Like a baby in demon years, <laughs> a baby baby in goddess years, and really a teenager in human years. Tristan, he's going through a lot right now. It's not painful in the physical sense, but it's got to be rough on the mental mind. And we see even the Tristan Platoon is a bit worried about this. But Percival steals his resolve and tightens the grip on his blade. And then we cut away. And we do get to see that as they lower the drawbridge, seemingly outside of Britannia, they're close to the castle, but they're leaving. We see that Meliodas is like, hey, sorry, kid. You know, I would have prepared a bigger send off since it's such a big deal, but we're short on time. And we see that Tristan. Being all serious, as serious as he can be, he's like, hey, ain't no problem, Pops. This ain't a parade. We shouldn't do anything re needlessly reckless to stir up the citizens' unrest. Right, Papa? And like, ah! Like, I know, I know. Once again, you can read four nights without ever reading a single page. A, a, a panel of seven deadly sins. You don't need a crumb of context. But like... Knowing the story behind Meliodas, knowing that he went through 4,000 years of suffering to be called Papa. Dog, that just hits different. That just hits different. I don't know. It hits different to me, right? Because Meliodas waited so, so long so he could be happy with Elizabeth and have his kid. And then, of course, he gets the kid, but now he needs to send this kid on this dangerous mission. And sure, it is prophesized that they will save the world right destroy camelot so long story short the plot's already written being completely real no matter what happens the four knights will win one way or another but that doesn't mean it's going to be a painless win that doesn't mean it's going to be an easy win that doesn't mean that his child isn't going to suffer in the same way that he suffered so i bet and you can see even in elizabeth's face but has a smile on right now but elizabeth looks worriedly at her son 
because she's sending him out into a war. A war that she, as the Bloody Ellie, and Meliodas as the leader of the Ten Commandments, is a concept that they're all too familiar with. They've seen war and what it can do to people, what it did to them. And now they're sending their only, well, we don't know. Maybe they have another child, but I think literally they're sending their only child off to fight in this war. Because they themselves, well, no, Elizabeth should be able to go with, don't get me wrong, Elizabeth should be able to go with, but they cannot help as much as they would want to. And I think that's, that's really rough for both of them. But like, man, once again, and it only works if you read Seven Deadly Sins. Like a friend of mine asked me, right? Because he finally found the channel. I don't know which one of you people got, got the got the reach far enough that he found the channel. And he was like, hey, dude, I really like your Four Nights reviews. Should I read it? And I was like, did you read Seven Deadly Sins? He's like, oh, well, I watched season one and two of the anime. But like, that was it. I, I just couldn't keep watching. I was like, ah, you. I told him to read Seven Deadly Sins if he wants to read Four Nights. And tell him to take his time. Because I think it's... I, I don't think you get the same out of Fortnite. And in fact, that's a question for y'all. Do you think you get the same emotional impact and stuff and connection out of Fortnite if you didn't read Seven Deadly Sins? Tell me down below. I want to know. I want to know. Though we do get to see that Meliodas, being the worried father that he is, he's like, hey, don't push yourself. Okay, Tristan? You're still a dude. I'm sending you out there on your own. And don't go demon. Because I should have trained you on that. But, hey, we do what we must. And we see that Tristan says, if I don't push myself, I don't think we'll find Camelot. And Melios is like, that's what I said. <laughs> and it, it, this is a very, like, I don't know. I remember my teenage years with my dad. And it was also this very, like, touch and go, trying to impress him, trying to be worthy thing. Like, I, I can definitely understand where Tristan's coming from, right? Like, it's, especially in regards to the father, like, the same kind of tie that I have with my mom is something that I see with Tristan and Elizabeth. Tristan fully trusts his mom. You can see that in the movie, you can see that here, where he's smiling, open, happy with her. But with his dad, no matter how supportive his dad is and how much he cares, which is obvious by how Meliodas, Meliodas definitely loves his son. You can tell it, 100%. But in the same way that my dad loved me. Like, at that age, you're much more worried about impressing him, proving your worth to him, and being hard and stoic and all that that he was. And I can definitely understand where Tristan struggles with that as a guy who's very much not built for war, at least based on my own interpretations of his character. If this never happened, if he never had to go and fight Camelot, I don't think he would ever wish it. Like... In Attack on Titan, there was an alternate story that was released. And I think it was either in that alternate story or Isayama himself came out and said, no matter what, Eren would be a character who pursues conflict. It's just in his nature. It is in his blood. One way or another, if there is no conflict, he will make one. Meanwhile, I don't see that in Tristan. I see Tristan as a person who would avoid conflict at any cost. But when push comes to shove, he will do whatever it takes to end a conflict. And that's what he's going through now. It's in a really rough spot. I do feel bad for the kid. And I think it's the same thing with Percival. Percival would have been content to live his life. Well, maybe not. He would have. He did want to explore. When Varghese went to sleep, he did have that whole thing about exploring. But that was exploring. It wasn't conflict. Percival asked for an exciting life of exploration. He never asked for a war. And... Gwen seems like she'd be happy being the strongest on her own little island with all the pudding in the world. So this really is a group of kids who just want to live their lives. Lancelot too. Like Lancelot's unbelievably powerful now. But I feel like even he, the war of the Four Knights of the Apocalypse, if he could just get Jericho back, Arthur would leave them alone and he could just go live with his mom and dad, he'd be happy. None of these kids want this war. But Fate itself has decreed that they all must fight in it. And that's, that's sad. <laughs> it, it's going to be cool. It's going to result in tons of amazing battles and character conflict and character development and character growth. I love it. But at the same time, I definitely feel bad for the kids. Because this is something that I don't think they would ever do in any other world. Then we do get to see that Elizabeth walks up and is like, Tristan, I wish you all the best. 
please be sure you'll come back to us. And Tristan, with a smile on his face, promises that he'll be back. And we see the two share a hug. And Meliodas is like, ugh, I agree. Y'all, y'all just so sappy. Y'all lucky the other people are watching, because I'd be hugging too. But with that being the case, we see that Percy looks on, and he's like, huh, to have a mom and dad, it makes me jealous. And darn, like, Nagama really, like, at the end of this chapter was like, you know what? Boom. Emotional gut punch. Boom. Another emotional gut punch. We're going to keep torturing. <laughs> We're going to keep making you feel. And, yeah, it's it's true. <sighs> Percival had a dad. He still does. Ironside is his father. But he was not the traditional father. And he still isn't. Of course, he tried to execute his own son. And executed his own father. And Percival never met his mom. He has no idea who his mom is. So, seeing a mother and father, being a mother and father, being loving, being kind, being caring, taking care of their child, it's got to hit deep for Percy. Because he never had that. And of course, I doubt he... There's no way he, like, hates Tristan for it. It's not like he's going to develop any j real jealousy. But just the idea of having it. The idea of being in a family with people is something that Percival obviously cares about. As a guy who only had one person and then was left alone. Man, Percival's like a super sad and dark character despite how happy he is. And we even see two characters with parents like feel bad or feel discouraged in their own unique way. Like Lancelot, he lets out a sigh and is likely thinking of his own parents as he looks away. And Gawain drops her head and looks down. And we know she more is aligned to her grandparents, her granny and grandpa, in comparison to her parents, who we know one is the stepbrother of Arthur, we don't know her mom. So who knows what kind of childhood she had. So we got some traumatized kids here, folks. <laughs> and we know the more you traumatize your characters, the better they are in the long run. <laughs> you got to keep them tortured. You got to keep them tortured. And we do get to see <laughs> that Tristan finally runs up after getting all the parent exposure. He's like, oh, sorry to keep you waiting, everyone. Mother and father are just so embarrassing. Always treating me like a child. And we do see something weird. Oh, never mind. That's Gil Thunder and uh, Margaret. With Kyana. All right. But we see <laughs> that this, ironically enough, this face that Lancelot makes doesn't look like Lancelot at all. It reminds me of Zeldris. I'm not sure why the very specific expression that Lancelot makes on this page. And Sylvan is here. I just noticed that Sylvan is standing right there. <laughs> oh, the chat is back. The chat is, he's been gone for so many chapters. The chat is back. But we see that Lancelot with his Zeldris looking face is like, oh, mother and father. Don't you mean mama and papa? <laughs> and <laughs> Tristan's eyes bulge out he's like you be quiet why must you always say more than you need he almost went demon mark and destroyed the entire kingdom right there by the way and we see that Percival's like mama and papa what does that mean and we see Lancelot goes on to explain as Tristan keeps screaming and you know like what do you all call your parents I call them I mean, it really depends. Like, if I'm referring to certain people, it changes. Like, I'll call them my mother and father. I'll call them originators. I'll call them creators. I'll call them... <laughs> I call them the originals. And I and I constantly refer to myself as the remix. That's just a music joke I run with me and my cousins. Like, th th there's a multitude of things that I call them. But, like, I mean, mama and papa isn't that bad. Like... Mommy and daddy, I, I would get still being a little... Like, I would definitely tease my friends over that. <laughs> I'm like, really? But that's just because of the context of those words in our day and age. That's not any, like, bad thing. Like, if you still call your parents that, that's fine. It's just that I'm a sick, disgusting human being who has heard that phrase in other contexts. Has been called... Well, regardless, like, it's... The word context has changed. <laughs> At least in the modern day. So, I don't get why Trista is freaking out over mama and papa though i guess it still is childish right so whatever way of childish and we see that lance is like hey chill out bro i'll go get you a berry pie from reticence later reticence 
You gotta go buy a pie from Joel, bro. But with that being the case, we see that Tris is like, oh, well, shoot. All you had to do was say that, homeboy. All right, let's get it. And we see that Gil Thunder and Margaret are with Kion. And Gil Thunder's like, hey, Kion, are you gonna help Prince Tristan? And we see Kion even directly acknowledges that, yeah, so Tristan may not need my help, but I'm gonna help him. And we see that Gil Thunder says, I envy you, you know? And Kion looks at him and is like, hey, what do you mean? And Gil Thunder says, because you're going on an adventure with someone you admire from your own generation. And of course, Gil Thunder is looking at Meliodas, a person who was not from his generation that he could not adventure with, but someone he looked up to the most, obviously. And man, once again, like th this doesn't this doesn't hit unless you read Seven Deadly Sins. But regardless, we see Kion have a moment of introspection, and he's like, "You're right. I'm going, mother, father." And they lead away, and we see that Percival declares, "All right." We're heading out. And the group walks off into the great unknown. Notably, they're all still together for now. So maybe we're going to have like at least one chapter of them traveling together. And then they're going to split at a certain point. But overall, I really, really like this chapter. It has so much in it. Obviously, from the early setup of the new plot with the group splitting up. To the revelation of Lance's power. To the revelation of... Lance's feelings about going home and Meliodas' request for him to go home to the reveal that Dragon Handle will be staying with Percival all the way to the, the nice character sadness stuff at the end. I really, really like this chapter. However, that's what I think. Please tell me what you guys think in the comment section down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. to like, share, comment, and subscribe. You see that all the case supposed to be out on any videos that come to the channel. Also, also, I do a Patreon down below and support for as low as one. Got them one dollar a month. You exclusive videos, early content, and more. Thank you guys so much for watching once again, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is Dago the Pencil, writing off.